how does anybody qualify to take part in the study? Yeah, well, uh, you need to be prepared to, you need to be a mum who is prepared to breastfeed um, exclusively. For, uh, exclusively for at least six months. But what happens is the participants uh, 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 randomly at three months of age, when the baby is three months of age, either continue to exclusively breastfeed or are introduced into their diet, particularly the sort of foods that cause allergies, such as dairy products, peanuts, eggs, etc. And these children will be followed up for three years, both arms of the study, so 650 in each group. And we will see which group um, uh, fares better with respect to uh, allergies, food allergies, other health parameters as well. Mandy, you work with people whose lives really are hugely impacted mm. by allergies, don't you? I mean, th th we have to find out why this is happening so much more frequently. Uh, absolutely, and I think that because um, so many children will present for the first time with allergic symptoms when they are very, very young, when they are being weaned or when they're still very much in infancy, it's a, it's a terribly scary time for parents when they're first seeing these reactions in their children. They they maybe don't know what they're, what they're seeing, or even if they do know what they're seeing, they don't understand how to manage it and how to deal with it. And we do need to have a more... Um, more understanding of, of what parents can expect, how they can um, deal with this, and more importantly where we are at the moment is that we need more accurate and timely diagnosis for these children. Yes, I mean, tell us about the first signs of an allergy in a young baby. Well, it, the, the problem with allergy is that it is so wide-reaching that there could be any number of different symptoms. So, for example, on introducing foods such as Gideon mentioned, such as milk, egg or peanut, which are known to cause reactions, the parent might see a they might just see some localised reactions, some, some small symptoms. Um, we also know now that there are other symptoms such as the uh, gastro symptoms, so stomach complaints and conditions that children may be have historically suffered from such as um, reflux and constipation could be indicators of allergic disease so there's such a wide amount of symptoms um, and I think it's important that parents if they've got any worry at all that what they're seeing is not normal and parents know their child better than anyone they should go and see their family doctor who should using the, the new nice guidelines about diagnosing food allergy know what to do and where to go from there. Now I, I know that um, Gideon the study has been structured to suggest that there is a sort of crucial period in weaning when uh, allergenic foods might be tolerated. Uh, is that correct? And, and what is that period of time exactly? Yes, that is right. And the answer is we don't know what the precise period and of that's time what we need is. To find out. But we do have some evidence to suggest that it is certainly within the first year of life and possibly earlier. And um, studies that others have published and also studies we are doing are, are now showing that you can already detect um, the IgE antibody, the allergic antibody, in the blood of uh, babies at three months of age. That the immunological ball has started to roll downhill and is accelerating. And the, the question is when we can prevent it, what is the window of opportunity? And the EAT study is, is aiming to do that in the first six months of life. But meanwhile, the official advice remains do not give your child solids until they're six months old. A absolutely, because we don't know which way the trial could go. We could see that either of the two groups um, is preferable in terms of an allergy outcome or we may see no difference um, if we knew the results of the study we wouldn't be doing the study I yeah, guess no of course but um, we've got we must look outside um, Western Europe presumably and there must be parts of the world where almost nobody's allergic to peanuts are there yes and uh, uh, more uh, rural societies where uh, allergy is generally less uh, less frequent, uh, farming societies. Uh, if you look at uh, geographical parts of the world, uh, Africa, uh, particularly in rural Africa, there's uh, almost uh, no uh, peanut allergy. Uh, of course, the environmental conditions there are very different. Um, a study undertaken by uh, Dr. Dutoy and myself some years ago compared uh, Jewish children in the UK Proszę with Jewish children in Israel with the same ancestral background and therefore the same 
genetic make, um, makeup, essentially. You'd think they'd be very similar. And you would think they would be very similar, but we found a tenfold increase in the rate of peanut allergy um, in the UK children in primary schools. And in contrast, we found that while the UK children were uh, avoiding peanuts completely in the first year of life, the Israeli babies had peanuts introduced in substantial quantities into their diet from four or five months of age. And of course, it always goes without saying, Mandy, this is costing all of us money because it impacts on the NHS hugely. Well, it does. And I think that long term, there will be savings to the NHS if we can get the provision of allergy services right. I mean, it's not an overnight fix um, that, that we can um, change things. But long term, the NHS must start making better provision for the many, many people living with allergies because at the moment what's happening is it's taking up to maybe three four appointments with the family doctor to get diagnosed it's then maybe taking sort of referrals on to organ based specialists to try and get to the bottom of what's happening and on and on we go and on and on and it costs money right mandy thank you um gideon very briefly how do you uh, get in touch if you'd like to take part in the study yeah well uh, the best uh thing is to con really uh, look on our website, which is uh, www.eatstudy.co.uk, and there's also a toll-free number. Uh, well, zip. don't worry about that. We'll, we'll put all the details on the Women's but, website. Um, but well, that's there. great, but okay. uh, we are still looking for participants, and it's mothers who are uh, exclusively breastfeeding and intend to exclusively breastfeed their babies for the first six months of life. That's very clear. Thank you very much, Gideon, and thank you, Mandy, for coming in thank this you. morning. Now, our Women in Business series is following the working lives of three women as they try to grow their businesses. Choosing the name of your business or product may well be the very first thing you do, but it won't be the easiest. You can get this very, very wrong. Something you think highly amusing may end up being just too clever by half, or even deeply offensive in a foreign language. One of our entrepreneurs is Daniela Genus, who runs Aspire for You, a community interest company that also runs training courses for young people and organises events. Now, the business mentor we've paired her with, paired her with um, Gita Patel of Stargate Capital, persuaded Daniela that the two sides to her business should be split into two separate companies, and that means a new name for one of the I think that for her event management company, it's important to be a limited company so that any liabilities are limited. And also, it can end up supporting the community interest company because funding for companies like that is getting harder and harder. But what's the new company called? We're still trying to work it out. We want to keep the element of Aspire for you, but obviously we need to make it clear that it's a lim limited company and it is focusing on events, so we're still deliberating on, on that one. Choosing a name is critical, isn't it? Getting the right name? One of the things that we've done successfully is built a, a really good reputation for the cultural and community events that we've done. So to let go of Aspire for You totally, I think, would be a bad move. I don't um, agree with that. Well, we were looking at kind of Aspire for You events management, Aspire for You events limited, Aspire for You limited. And, and also taglines help a lot. The new one could be Aspire for You limited and events management and artist booking agency. And that works. And that works. Well, Julia Wilde is here. She's the MD of the brand agency Iconic. Um, in a way, you might think it'd be fun to come up with your business name, but it's often not very much fun, and it's hugely important as well, isn't it? Uh, yes, you're right. It is hugely important. It is the most long-lasting, visible and connecting aspect of a brand, so it's really important to get it right. And why do so many people not get it right? Well, it's a bit difficult to come up with a brand name that crystallizes the experience of the brand. And also these days, a lot of brand names, good brand names, have already been taken by other companies. Um, and trying to get the irrelevant URL is also increasingly difficult. Crystallize the experience of a brand. No, that might, might be all right in your brand agency, but, but I'm, not, I'm not sure it works for me. What do you mean? Well, what we mean by that is coming up with a name that either uh, sums up the brand values, sums up what's unique about your brand, why so I might want to buy it. Exactly, yes. Yeah. That de defines your brand as being unique to your customers or a client. So, well, what's wrong with just using a couple of names? I mean, sometimes names sound great, and other times they don't, of course. When you say names, do you mean names of uh, yeah, I mean, the um, individual, uh, his, the, the chemist beginning with B that doesn't sell footwear but does sell practically everything else you could need cosmetic wise and um, you can get a sandwich there these days, but so that's just somebody's name. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, you can do that. You know, a lot of very successful brands are called after the people who set up the company. For example, Disney, 
Johnson and Johnson, Conrad are examples. But that's okay because we know them. If you're if you're a fresh business, you're completely new. What do you do? You can't really use your name, can you? Um, you can't. No. If you're a startup company, unless you're getting your name.